Hi guys, we're here with illustrator extraordinaire, Doug. How you doing, Doug? Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, so Doug, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, um, how you became an illustrator? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I'm based in Melbourne, in Australia, and I'm a professional comic book artist and cartoonist, and I've been working professionally for about, God, 13 years, since 2003. Uh, prior to that, I was a toy designer, and prior to that, uh, I studied uh, illustration at university here in New South Wales, in Newcastle. Um, and I guess like most of the guys here, pretty much always been drawing and always been drawing cartoons, like since I was a kid and at school and things like that. Um, yeah, and it was always just a thing that I was drawn to and managed to luckily and with a lot of hard work, make a career out of it. Yeah. So, um, given your history, did you have any inspirations, or did, were there any were there any artists that you looked up to? Or? Yeah, um, there's well, there's lots, but I suppose uh, in my in my creative DNA, it's probably uh, things like Asterix and Tintin. Um, like I, I I moved around a bit as a kid, so I lived in the UK for a while, and so before I discovered things like Marvel comics. I was more reading things like Tintin and Asterix and Lucky Luke uh, and English sort of weekly kids comics like Beano and Bunty and... Desperate Dan? Des yeah, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so like kids gag comics as well. So that's kind of... Well, it's the stuff that I do now um, is mostly work for, for kids, for younger readers. Um, and stylistically... I'm probably more, yeah, in the wheelhouse of like Tintin and Asterix than say, you know, Marvel or DC or something like that, so, yeah. Well, can you tell us a bit about the publications you've been affiliated with here? Uh, in regards to stuff here, I think the oldest is probably Explorer, which is an anthology uh, of short stories, all based around uh, the concept of hidden doors. And that's the third book in a series. Uh, then Marilinga, Something's Amiss at the Zoo. So uh, Marilinga is a self-published book that I brought out last year. That's the first part. And I haven't had a chance to get to part two yet, <laughs> but it will be coming. Soon, right? Soon, Soon right? Uh, and then Something's Amiss at the Zoo, which is a, uh, a comic stroke picture book for younger, like quite young readers. Uh, and then the, the newest stuff is Last Kids on Earth, which is, uh, that came out literally this week. Um, so it looks like there's quite a bit of um, spans in um, genres here, basically. Yeah, yeah, I suppose I'm probably probably drawn to adventure and a little bit of humour. And I've kind of found a bit of a niche, because uh, I do a lot of work with publishers, like book publishers overseas. Uh, a lot of that stuff is usually weirdly horror-based, so it's kind of a horror genre for younger readers. So monsters and... Um, zombies and all that sort of thing. But yeah, ranging to like a comedy about at the zoo, to a post-apocalypse set in Australia, to like a fantasy. <laughs> well, so, so this is actually based in Australia? Right? Yes, yeah, Marilinga is based in Melbourne uh, and it's set 300 years in the future after uh, the nuclear tests in South Australia back in the 50s go horribly wrong and basically irradiate Australia. So what was the inspiration for that then? That sounds amazing. A friend of mine was putting together an anthology of uh, Ozploitation uh, stories and comics. And I'm just a big fan of post-apocalypse stories. It's always something that I've kind of been interested in, like in film and, and reading. Uh, and so it sort of felt like I wanted to do something like that. And then came across this pretty crazy story. It's not a story, it's true. Uh, a historical fact about America post World War One having a an official plan to basically knock out and attack the United Kingdom if the United Kingdom decided to flex their imperial muscle again post World War One, and so they had this plan called Plan Red, where they were going to knock out trade routes and naval bases around uh, key naval bases around uh, the world, but, and basically, yeah, like knock knock the UK off. Wow. Um, and then World War II happened and we all became friends and they shelved it. But the, the impetus was that I thought, well, they shelved it, but then 
Cold War comes around and the United Kingdom starts testing nuclear weapons in the desert in Australia, what would happen if America saw that at the height of the Cold War and went, oh, hang on a second, like, that's, that's not on, and then took Plan Red off the shelf and did all of this crazy, like basically enacted the plan and Australia then basically becomes this irradiated rock. And then we cut 300 years to the future and meet this girl living in uh, Melbourne. And then she goes on a big road trip and it's basically Akira meets the road meets Nautica, all sorts of crazy stuff. It's, it's amazing and I think it's also great as, um, you know, as a writer and as an as an illustrator as well, yep. that you can do things for children and also for young adults. Well. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I think there's a bit of a, a gap in the market, specifically in comics, for that sort of stuff. Like, comics has a, uh, a wonderful history of being able to shoot itself in the foot. Um, and so, you know, back in the 90s, when comics wanted to be taken seriously, it was all very serious. You know, things like Watchmen and Dark Knight, and it sort of flowed from there where, well, comics need to be taken seriously, so they need to be very adult and very dark. And, and I think it's starting to slowly come back uh, to the middle again. But there's nothing out there for kids. Like, I started reading comics as a kid. And if I was a kid now, I wouldn't know where to start. And, and I can't get access to them. I got comics in newsagents. Um, and they're not in newsagents anymore. They're at comic book shops. So unless you're a kid who goes into a comic book shop, even then, I'm like, well, where do I start? You know. So I think there's a big gap in the market in terms of comics for younger readers, and that's not good because they're the future of the future of comics. So, uh, and I think I think book publishers in particular are starting to kind of fill that gap. I know that because I'm working on a book at the moment uh, with Scholastic Graphics in the US, which is an all-ages graphic novel, uh, which will be out next year. And companies like Scholastic, Random House, uh, Penguin are producing graphic novels for younger readers and they're kind of filling that vacuum of space that companies like Marvel and DC are probably not giving as much time to as they should. Yeah, and kind of cutting their nose off despite their face, I think. So you heard that here first. <laughs> Controversial. <laughs> but, but, but it's great though, like, the fact that you've mentioned the next generation of comic book readers and, yeah, and yeah. You know, potentially comic book writers yeah. and therefore they need something to be inspired by as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't pick up a comic back when I was a kid and, and had access to, I mean, you know, there's access via the internet, but, you know, it, the internet is massive and, you know, to, to find an audience on the internet is relatively easy, but also quite difficult because of just the vastness of it. So, um, yeah, I think it's a pretty important, uh, yeah, a really important thing for the future of the medium. So, so yeah. Hope I like, find your niche and hope it gets, you know, yeah, absolutely. Hope it gets absolutely. much, much bigger than that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, Doug. Thank you very Take much. Care. Cheers. Thanks, guys.